Welcome to the examinations technique presentation for paper CA 2.1 financial reporting. This presentation is equally applicable to paper DA8 financial reporting for the diploma in accountancy qualification. My name is Hanson Goma and I will be taking you through this presentation. Uh, in terms of the background to the presentation, the presentation is aimed at sharing examinations technique which is intended to help students maximize their chances of passing their examinations in financial reporting. We may define examinations techniques. Components of examination technique. There are a number of items involved in examination technique and we may refer to a timeline over which the activities relating to examination technique take place. Examination techniques starts well before the final examination itself and the final examination itself is simply the end activity to examination technique. There are three areas that we can consider under examination techniques. Adequate preparation, which is an activity taking place well before the final exam. Just prior to the examination, what should a candidate preparing for a particular examination do or avoid just prior to the final examination? During the final examination, there are a number of do's and don'ts which candidates must pay attention to as they are attempting the examination. Adequate preparation takes place well before the final examination. This is the main part of examinations technique. In most cases, candidates are mistaken. They think examinations techniques starts right in the final exam itself. Examination techniques starts well before the final exam as you are preparing for the final exam itself. There are a number of components of adequate preparation. We can list these as know the syllabus. Know the key areas of the syllabus. Knowing the syllabus is not enough. You should pinpoint which areas in the syllabus are the most important areas. Otherwise, there is a danger that you put too much effort on areas which may not be regarded as the key examination areas. So you should know the key examination areas in addition to knowing the whole syllabus. Cover the syllabus adequately. Ensure adequate timed question practice. One of the unique features of professional accountancy examinations is that candidates are required to have in-depth practical skills in attempting the examinations. That can only come through question practice. Mayor question practice is not good enough. You need to time yourself as you are doing the questions. This will help you manage your time during the final examination. Timed question practice will not only help you practice time management during the final examination, it will also ensure that you are efficient during your revision sessions. You should be in a position to practice more questions if you time yourself as you are doing these questions. 
read the examiner's reports. Zika has a policy to publish examiner's reports for all the past examinations following each examination diet. It is important that you read the examiner's report. The whole idea behind reading the examiner's report is so that you have an idea what significant weaknesses were observed by the markers or examiners during past examination sessions. Reading the examiner's report should also help you know how to interpret the questions that come in the examinations. The examiner's report will also give you statistics on the pass rates with regard to the past examinations. Use latest study materials. For papers like financial reporting, it is even more important that you use the latest materials because we normally have frequent changes in accounting standards. Using an outdated text is very dangerous. To that end, it is very important that you use the latest study manuals and revision texts, which is a rich source of articles on the latest development in accounting. You will normally find at least an article on a new accounting standard. Know the syllabus. How do you get to know the syllabus? Refer to your student handbook. This section of the syllabus accounts for 20% of the total syllabus. Single entity financial statements. This component of the syllabus accounts for 25% of the total syllabus. Consolidated financial statements. This component of the syllabus accounts for another 25% financial appraisals or interpretation of financial statements. This accounts for 30% of the syllabus. Interpret the topic areas of the syllabus. The main topics in the syllabus are summaries of the various knowledge items. In addition to knowing the topic areas of the syllabus, candidates must refer to the detailed syllabus which outlines the learning outcomes of the syllabus. Consider the past examination questions. You must have a habit of downloading all the past examination papers to have an idea what topics are normally examined, what the examination format is, and also to have an idea what examiners expect as you look at their suggested solutions. So you should consider the past examination questions as part of examination technique. Consider the format of the examination. The format of the examination is stated in the student handbook at the end of the syllabus. The question is predominantly based on consolidated financial statements. And this question carries 40% of the total examination. In section B, candidates are required to make a choice of three questions out of four questions. Each section B question carries 20 marks. And these questions will normally be on areas, key areas such as preparation of single entity published financial statements, preparation of statements of cash flows, interpretation of financial statements, 
there is normally at least a question on a specified or specified accounting standards. And from what I have just pointed out, every candidate should know that group accounts is a very important part of the syllabus, accounting for 40% of the total examination. And every candidate should know that they are likely to have at least a 20 mark question in section B on preparation of single entity financial statements. Every candidate should know that in section B they are likely to have at least one 20 mark question on interpretation of financial statements. Every candidate should also know that in section B, they will have at least one question requiring them to explain. So based on what I have just pointed out, you should note that the following are the key areas of the syllabus. Accounting standards, single entity financial statements, group financial statements, statements of cash flows. So even as you are doing your revisions, even as you are covering your syllabus, based on what I have just pointed out, you should therefore take note that the following are key areas of the syllabus. The various accounting standards contained in your syllabus, single entity financial statements, group financial statements, statements of cash flows, interpretation of financial statements. Even as you are doing your revision and question practice, make sure that these areas are thoroughly covered. And also take note that accounting standards relate to preparation of financial statements such that when you look at the single entity financial statements you can only prepare single entity financial statements if you have knowledge of contents of accounting standards the section of the syllabus on preparation of single entity financial statements single entity financial statements can only be prepared if you know the contents of accounting standards at this point, we can take a break, and after the break, we'll look at what are the exact contents of these key areas of the syllabus. Welcome back, and we are now going to look at each key area of the syllabus with a view to pointing out what are the components of knowledge that are required? Under accounting standards, the following standards would be applicable. Under accounting standards, in general, all the accounting standards in the IFRS framework are within your CA 2.1 syllabus, with a few exceptions. Specifically, the hot areas within your CA 2.1 syllabus include the following. IAS 1, Presentation of Financial Statements. This accounting standard gives the background to the preparation of financial statements using the IFRS framework. The key areas of the standard which every student must appreciate include the objective of financial statements. According to IAS1, the objective of financial statements is to provide decision useful information to a range of users on the entity's financial performance, financial position, cash flows, and changes in financial position. 
you should know the characteristics of decision useful information IS1 has simply picked these from the conceptual framework for financial reporting the characteristics of decision useful information are in two parts we have the primary characteristics, the fundamental characteristics, and the enhancing characteristics. We have two primary characteristics, relevancy and faithful presentation. Further, we have three enhancing characteristics. Comparability, timeliness, and understandability. Candidates must appreciate the relationship between the primary characteristics and the enhancing characteristics. Another element within IAS1 is the contents of financial statements. Candidates should know what IAS1 prescribes as being the contents of financial statements. These are in two parts. We have the accounts and the notes to the accounts. Candidates must distinguish the accounts which the standard requires to be included in the financial statements. Include a statement of financial position, a statement of cash flows, in addition to this, candidates must appreciate that IAS1 requires extensive disclosures in respect of the accounts, which are part of the financial statements. Non-current assets. We have five accounting standards. It is a highly examinable area as non-current assets are likely to be a significant part of every entity's total assets. Specifically, we have IAS's 16, 38, 36, 40, and 23, which are within your syllabus. The key areas that you must note as you are revising this area include under IAS 16 you should know the recognition criteria one cost of fair value can be reliably measured two future economic benefits controlled by the entity are probable the standard also requires entities to determine carrying amounts of property planned and equipment according to its requirements. With regard to measurement of property planned and equipment, IAS 16 considers two points in time at which to measure property planned and equipment. Initially, when property planned and equipment is just acquired, in general, the standard requires that the property planned and equipment must be measured at cost. You should be conversant with the components of cost. In general, cost must include all costs incurred in acquiring property planned and equipment and putting it in a usable state. Take note of the spe specific elements. Take note of the specific elements which must be included in cost, including the purchase price, net of trade discounts, the production cost, including production overheads absorbed based on normal activity level, the purchase price, including freight, including in transit, insurance, including irrecoverable taxes, the initial cost should also include commissioning costs. 
and decommissioning costs in accordance with IAS 37. As a matter of policy, the standard requires entities to choose between the cost model and the revaluation model. Where the entity wants to use the revaluation model, the standard has a number of requirements with regard to using the revaluation model. In the first place, the model can be used purely as a matter of accounting policy. However, that policy must be applied consistently. Following a revaluation, the new carrying amount must be fair value. Candidates must pay attention, must pay particular attention. Candidates must pay particular attention to accounting for revaluation gains and losses. Though primarily gains and losses may be reported in other comprehensive income, there are a few times exceptions when they must be reported as part of profit or loss. So make sure you revise when a revaluation gain gets reported in profit or loss, when a revaluation loss gets reported in profit or loss, instead of reporting these in other comprehensive income. Another area relating to subsequent measurement of property, plant, and equipment is depreciation. With regard to depreciation, the standard requires that every item in property, plant, and equipment must be depreciated, with a few exceptions. The standard requires that the depreciation method must reflect the pattern of consuming economic benefits. The standard requires that any changes in the depreciation method should be treated as a change in accounting estimate in accordance with IAS 8, changes in accounting estimates, policies, and errors. Another area relevant to subsequent measurement is enhancement expenditure. Students must take note of when subsequent expenditure must be capitalized. as enhancement when it should not be capitalized. So those are the important areas related to IAS 16. IAS 38, intangible asset. The main area where most candidates find a challenge on IAS 38 is the recognition criteria. IS 38 in general requires that an entity should only recognize intangible assets if three criteria are met. Cost of fair value can be reliably measured. Future economic benefits controlled by the entity are probable. And the asset is identifiable. An asset is only identifiable if it can be realized on its own without need to realize the entire business or the asset represents legally enforceable rights. The standard specifically prohibits the recognition of internally generated intangible assets. Unless these are being recognized as development costs. To that end, the standard has a number of criteria which must be met if development costs have to be capitalized as assets. Make sure in your preparation you are aware of the six criteria which must be met in capitalizing development costs. IAS 36, impairment of assets. 
IAS 36 is a general standard on impairment of assets. It applies in general to all assets unless we have specific exceptions where a type of asset impairment is covered by another standard. Under impairment of assets, the key things to revise or to know include when is an asset impaired? How do we determine whether an asset has been impaired? Impairment reviews. When should we carry out an impairment reviews? What are the indicators of possible impairment? How would we review cash generating units for impairment? And how would we account for impairment losses? The definition of investment property is important. Candidates should distinguish between owner-occupied properties and investment properties. The two have different accounting treatment. Owner-occupied properties will be accounted for under IAS 16, whereas investment properties get accounted for under IAS 40. The general definition of investment property Property owned for rental income or for capital gains. In terms of the accounting, the recognition criteria is the same as for owner-occupied properties. Recognize an investment property if future economic benefits controlled by the entity are probable and cost or fair value can be reliably measured. Measurement of investment property is important. Initial measurement, we have same provisions as for owner-occupied properties. Measure at cost. However, the main difference with regard to accounting for investment properties arises on subsequent measurement. IAS 40 requires that purely as a matter of accounting policy, a reporting entity should choose between the cost model and the fair value model. The cost model in IAS 40 requires that we account for investment properties in the same way we account for them under IAS 16. The fair value model of IAS 40 requires that we shouldn't depreciate investment properties. Instead, each reporting debt an investment property must be remeasured to its fair value. With revaluation gains and losses reported in profit or loss. IAS 23, borrowing costs. This standard is primarily in general for accounting for borrowing costs, which have been defined as all costs incurred in respect of an entity's borrowings. It is primarily not for accounting for non-current assets. However, within the accounting requirements of IAS 23, non-current assets may be affected. The key points to note in the standard include definition of borrowing costs, Appreciate the various elements of borrowing costs. Interest payments, transaction costs, discounts on issue or redemption, premiums on issue or redemption, exchange gains and losses. Appreciate the definition of a qualifying asset. An asset that takes substantial time to acquire. Appreciate the accounting requirements of IAS 23. The standard has two treatments with regard to borrowing costs, which are not options but which are compulsory. The standard requires that borrowing costs must primarily be charged in profit or loss for the period in which they have accrued. However, the standard requires that borrowing costs must be capitalized as part of cost of 
an asset where the borrowings on which the costs arise were intended, were incurred to finance acquisition of a qualifying asset. In that case, we have to capitalize the borrowing costs. The important elements which you must note with regard to capitalizing borrowing costs include at what point in time should the reporting entity start capitalizing borrowing costs? At what point in time should the entity stop capitalizing the borrowing costs? In general, the standard requires that borrowing costs should only be capitalized if they accrue during periods when there are activities leading to acquisition of assets. So that aspect is likely to be um, examined, highly examinable, in case you get a question on IS-23. Another element which is of high relevance to examination is any income that may be generated from temporal investment of borrowed funds before these are used to acquire the qualifying assets. So make sure you are conversant with the treatment of income, which basically offsets the borrowing cost to be capitalized, and determining, quantifying the borrowing costs which must be capitalized and which does not qualify for capitalizing and hence must be expensed in profit or loss. Accounting for leases, IFRS 16 is another key area under accounting standards. This is a new standard and every candidate should expect it to be very prominent in the next few coming exams. It has replaced IAS 17 and it is very important that candidates use the latest materials which contain the material on IFRS 16. The most important elements within the standard include accounting by the LEC and accounting by the LISA. Within accounting by the LEC, candidates must note that we now capitalize all leases. When it comes to LEC accounting, it's no longer relevant to distinguish between finance and operating leases. To that end, candidates should know how to account for the asset under lease, the right of use asset. Initially and subsequently, candidates should know how to account for the lease liability initially and subsequently. Candidates should also bear in mind that the distinction between finance and operating lease is still relevant under IFRS 16, but with regard to accounting by the LISA. In general, accounting by the LISA under IFRS 16 is not very different from how we were doing it under IAS 17. The LISA must derecognize the asset under lease as the commercial substance is. The asset no longer belongs to them. Instead, the LISA must account for an investment in the finance lease. Initially, at the initial investment in the lease, subsequently, the investment in the finance lease will be measured at amortized cost. If the lease is an operating lease, the LISA will continue to account for the asset under lease as owned by them. In accordance with the usual applicable standard, most likely IA 16. However, with regard to the lease, the only thing the LISA would account for are the lease rentals, which must be accrued as income over the lease term on a straight line basis. 
IAS 37, Provisions and Contingencies. A very important standard, highly examinable, and important points include definitions. What is a provision? What is a contingency? With regard to provisions, definition of reliability is very important because it is part of recognition criteria for provisions. A provision can only be recognized if three criteria are met. A provision can only be recognized if three criteria are met. One, there is a present obligation to transfer economic benefits in future as a result of a past event or transaction, which is itself definition of reliability. It is probable that we are going to transfer economic benefits in future. The amount involved can be reliably measured. Contingencies must not be recognized in the financial statements. However, the standard requires that contingent liabilities must be recognized unless their likelihood of being confirmed as liabilities is remote. Contingent assets must not be disclosed unless they are probable. The standard also gives guidance on the measurement of provisions. In general, we should measure provisions at the most likely amount, where a provision arises from a population of transactions. We may measure the provision at expected value. The standard also requires provisions to be discounted, recognized at a discounted amount, where the effect of discounting is material. Reporting financial performance, very important area with a number of accounting standards. We have IAS 8, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates, and prior period errors. Candidates should know the required treatment of changes in accounting policies, that is, apply a new policy retrospectively. Candidates should know the accounting treatment of changes in accounting estimates, that is, a change in accounting estimate must be accounted for prospectively. We should not restate the opening balances with regard to uh, changes in accounting estimates. Candidates must know that prior period errors must be corrected retrospectively by restating the opening balances and the comparatives from the past. IAS 21, effects of changes in foreign exchange rates. This standard is newly examinable at this level. In the past, IAS 21 was only examinable at the final levels. In advanced financial reporting, with this in mind, candidates should note that examiners have a tendency to test whether people are ready for things that have just become examinable. IAS 21 is one such area. And the component of IAS 21 examinable at this level is with regard to individual foreign currency transactions. Aspects relating to translation of financial statements of foreign operations is not examinable. The key things to note as you are revising IAS 21 include the definition of functional currency, definition of foreign currency, definition of monetary items, non-monetary items, and their implications for translation. Revise the prescribed translation rates. The standard requires that initially all foreign currency amounts are translated at the temporal rate. Subsequently, we only retranslate monetary items with gains and losses reported in profit or loss. 
IAS2 is a basic standard which was adequately covered at the lower level. Inventory evaluation. However, the standard is still important at this level as it has direct as measurement or valuation of inventory has direct impact on measurement of profit or loss. IFRS 5, non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations. A highly examinable standard. Non-current assets held for sale. Pay attention to the definition when a non-current asset can be classified as held for sale. The criteria outlined in IFRS 5, very important. You may have a scenario question that requires you to conclude whether an asset must be classified as held for sale or not. Definition of discontinued operation. A component that has been sold or terminated where it represents a separate line of an entity's business or geographical area of operations or it is a disposal group held for sale. These definitions are very important. Accounting requirements. Take note of the accounting requirements in IFRS 5. How do we measure non-current assets held for sale? Subsequent to classifying the asset as held for sale, no more depreciation. The asset must be carried at the lower of carrying amount or debt class as held for sale and fair value less disposal costs. Any remeasurement gains and losses must be reported in profit or loss. Presentation in the statement of financial position and in the statement of profit or loss. The standard requires that non-current assets held for sale must be presented within current assets. The standard requires that results from discontinued operations should be presented separately on the face of the statement of profit or loss. IFRS 15, recognition of revenue from contracts with customers, another highly examinable standard. This has replaced this has replaced the superseded IAS 18 and one would expect it to be highly examinable. Every entity has a revenue figure to report. The key things to note in IFRS 15 include the scope of the standard. When does a contract fall within the scope of IFRS 15? A contract in which an entity assumes obligations for which it will receive consideration. Consider the five conditions which must be met before an entity can consider recognizing revenue. With regard to the five-step model for recognizing revenue under IFRS 15, candidates should be in a position to apply each step recognize contracts with customers establish the performance obligations measure the transaction price allocate the transaction price to the performance obligations recognize revenue upon meeting the performance obligations. With regard to meeting the performance obligations and recognition of revenue, candidates should know, should distinguish between recognizing the revenue at a point in time, when obligations are fulfilled at that point in time, and recognition of revenue over time where performance obligations are satisfied over time. Specifically, with regard to recognizing revenue over time, candidates 
should be conversant with how we account for constructed contracts or in general contracts where performance obligations are satisfied over time. The basis of recognizing revenue, profit or loss on such contracts and amounts that we report in the statement of financial position, that is contract assets or liabilities. Financial instruments. Financial instruments is a very important area examinable from this level to the next level. At CA 2.1 level, we are only required to know, to have basic knowledge of financial instruments. The basic requirements in I-32, basic requirements of IFRS 9. Specifically, with regard to IAS 32, candidates are expected to know definitions relating to financial instruments, a financial instrument, a financial asset, a, finan a financial liability, an equity instrument. Candidates are expected to appreciate the accounting issue being addressed by IAS 32. That is distinguishing between liabilities and equity and presenting them according to their nature. The general requirement is present financial instruments according to their nature. In general, in contrasting between equity and liabilities, we consider that whereas liabilities present obligations to transfer cash, there is no such obligation with equity. Candidates must know IA32 requirements with regard to splitting compound instruments. The requirement in I32 is if we have a compound instrument, in general, a, co a compound instrument, I think we have to pause there. In general, IAS32 requires that where an entity has a transaction in a compound instrument. The transaction must be split into the components, that is the equity component and the liability component. And each component subsequently accounted for, initially and subsequently accounted for according to its nature. The split is therefore done at initial recognition. To that end, it is important that every candidate knows that a common example of a compound instrument is a convertible loan note. Candidates should know how to split the issue proceeds of convertible loan notes into the liability equity components and how each component is subsequently accounted for. Candidates should appreciate that the liability component is subsequently measured at amortized cost, increasing the initial liability with the accrued finance cost, reducing it by the cash paid. With regard to IFRS 9, the candidates must pay attention to the basic classifications for measurement purposes. In general, financial assets and liabilities are classified for measurement purposes as fair value through profit or loss, fair value through other comprehensive income, or fair value for measurement purposes in general. You can pause. For measurement purposes, IFRS 9 requires that financial assets and liabilities are classified as fair value through profit or loss items, fair value through other comprehensive income items, or 
as advertised cost items. It is crucial that you know when an asset falls to be classified as fair value through profit or loss, fair value through other comprehensive income, or as advertised cost items. In general, all liabilities at this level are likely to be classified as advertised cost items. Income taxes. It is crucial that candidates know how to account for income taxes. The main issue is accounting for the deferred tax. Basic accounting for deferred tax is highly examinable at this level.